Hello, everyone. This is Pastor Lewis Showers coming to you from Grace Baptist Church here in Washington, Indiana. You'll find us located in a red brick building up on a hill behind Bob's Pizza right off of State Road 57. We would really count it a privilege if you would come out and visit with us and participate in our public worship. At 9.30, we have a Sunday school hour, which is then followed by our morning worship service at 10.30. We would really consider it a privilege if you would come and visit with us. So I hope you'll take this invitation seriously and come on out and find out what are the benefits of attending Grace Baptist Church. Now, in the meantime, you say, I want to know more about what the church stands for or a little bit more about the church, or you have some questions regarding the Bible, or you want to dig into the Bible even further, we would invite you to our interactive website. You can get to our website by just typing in Grace Baptist Church, Washington, Indiana, or you can use our domain name, gbcwashingtonin.com. In either case, as you come into our website, you will find there are a number of valuable resources and so forth that are on our website that can be of help to you. There are a number of audio messages and even some video messages relating to books of the Bible or topics of the Bible. Likewise, there are some articles written on subjects that many individuals have questions about. And they are documented with scripture and give good biblical answers to the questions that are on people's minds. So I hope that you'll take a few minutes and come in and visit us on the website. But more importantly, we hope that you'll come and visit with us personally by coming out to our worship service on Sunday. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. He raised us up together, and he made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace, in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Father, I pray that you be with us this morning as we look at this passage as well as a number of other passages. May we get a better understanding of what this new life is, that we be we be, become a new creation in you. As we also explore the doctrine of grace, may we have a better appreciation for the dimension of this marvelous and wonderful characteristic of you as a God. Bless we pray, may the Spirit lead, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Well, we've been going through the scriptures and uh, looking at the various doctrines that we consider the most important ones from the Bible. We looked last time at the issue of the atonement and what atonement is and how it has been accomplished through Jesus Christ and Him alone. This week we want to focus in on the doctrine of becoming a new creation. As we go to the uh, doctrinal statement, we read the following. Of grace and the new creation, we believe that in order to be saved, Sinners must be, notice this, born again. That the new birth is a new creation in Christ Jesus. That in the new birth, the one dead in trespasses and sins, it made a partaker of the divine nature and receives eternal life, the free gift of God. That the new creation is brought about in a manner above our comprehension solely by the power of the Holy Spirit, in connection with divine truth, so as to secure our voluntary obedience to the gospel, that its proper evidence appears in the holy fruits of repentance and faith and newness of life. That's quite a, quite a bit of words to go through. And yet, as you look at those words, they are so profound because they are so much a part of what we hold so dearly in regards to the path to salvation. We believe it is through grace that the Lord Jesus Christ 
allowed us to be born again. And through that new birth, we became new creations. And though all uh, that is involved in that new creation is not yet known, yet it is already a part of us and is already at work in us. Now, let's take this thing apart, as we usually do with these doctrinal statements, and let's explore them in a little bit more detail. The means to our new life, the means to our new life is grace. The means to our new life is grace. You see, salvation, which leads to our new life, comes only through the grace of God. Let me say that again. Salvation, which leads to our new life, comes only through God's grace. That's the only way it can come. In first, our John, who, I, I, as I read John, and I read his gospel, and I read his epistle, I think more than just about any of the other writers, maybe then with the exception of Paul, he has a real grasp of this concept of grace, and how important grace is in the matter of salvation. In fact, it isn't long in his gospel before he begins to emphasize the fact that Jesus came not only to be the Savior of the world, but to do it through his grace. In John chapter 1, verse 14, we read these words. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Did you catch that? It is full of what? grace and truth and of his fullness we have received and grace and grace for the law was given through Moses but grace and truth came through who? Jesus Christ. Uh, you getting the idea that John is trying to put a little emphasis here on the word grace? Yes he is. Grace is Nothing more than God's unmerited favor that he shows toward the sinner. It is based then, the sole, sole basis of our salvation then is totally in the favor of God and the love of God, nothing in the merit of man. You see, this is what separates the salvation as it is given in the scriptures from all the other so-called paths to heaven. Someone once said to me, well, what's the difference between your view and such and such a church's view or such and such a group view or such and such a religion view? And I said to him, it is clear from the scriptures there is a remarkable difference between what the scripture demands and declares and what everyone else says. And the key of it is, everyone else says that salvation comes through at least part of the merit of man. Man has to do this, or man has to do this, or man has to do that in order to acquire salvation. That is even true in some denominations that call themselves Christian. What separates the scripture is the scripture says a man cannot do anything when it comes to the measure and the matter of salvation. It is totally the work of God's loving favor and nothing to do with the merit of man. In fact, we see this loving favor in spite of the merit of man in 1 John chapter 4 verse 9 where John writes these words, and this is the love of God, or I'm sorry, in this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might what through him? Yes. We might live through him. In other words, we might have salvation through him. This is the love of God. Now, he goes on to explain how great this love is. For in this is love, not that we love God, God. In fact, if anything, in our fallen states, we are not lovers of God, but rather we are the enemies of God. So there's nothing within ourselves and our fallen conditions that would make us lovable. And yet God shows how
how great His love is. And this is love, not that we love God, not that we did anything to try to merit that love, but that He loved us so much that He sent His Son to be the propitiation, the atonement for our sins. You see, the human love is of the approach of, well, as long as you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. But if you treat me wrong, then I'm going to treat you wrong. In that human nature, we've been watching a comedy uh, that was put out on the British public uh, British television uh, service, oh, probably about 20, 25 years ago. And the guy that's in there, he's, he's one of these individuals that you do him dirt, he'll do it right back. The episode we were watching last night, uh, these two ladies with their babies and walkers are, are walking by his house, they're stopping and talking, and, and uh, the one lady throws her can of whatever she had out on the lawn, and he's mad, and he, he sticks his head out through the window, and he says, hey, you, pick that up! And they just kind of ignore him and go on. So in turn, he knows where one of them lives, and you see this door where the mail slide is and all of a sudden you see this dead fish coming in. And you see this other item coming, I mean just all kinds of garbage and so forth. You, you really need to see the episode because it all comes back to haunt him at the very end. But that's the way man's love is. But that's not the way God's love is. God's love says even though you have transgressed against me, you are dead and your trespasses and sins and as far as I'm concerned, you are my enemy, yet I so love you, I gave myself for you. That I might atone for your sins, and that I might be able to give you your salvation free of charge. You don't have to do anything other than accept the gift of Jesus Christ and his salvation, right? This is demonstrated in a story I came across about LaGuardia. Usually when you think of LaGuardia, you think of the airport, but it was named after a mayor of New York City who was the mayor during some of the worst days of the Great Depression and all of World War II. And he was loved by the people of New York City. He, he was well known as a colorful character, and, and uh, he oftentimes was known of going out with like the police department on a raid, or he would go like with a fire department to a fire. I mean, he, he would just do these kind of things. The story is told that uh, he decided one day that he was going to go to a night court to serve the poorest ward of the city. LaGuardia dismissed the judge for the evening, and he took over the bench himself. Within a few minutes, a tattered old woman was brought before him and charged with stealing a loaf of bread. She told LaGuardia that her daughter's husband had deserted her. Her daughter was sick, and her two grandchildren were starving. But the shopkeeper from whom the bread was stolen refused to drop the charges. It's a real bad neighborhood, Your Honor. The man told the mayor, she's got to be punished to teach other people around here a lesson. LaGuardia sighed. He turned to the woman and said, well, I've got to punish you. The law makes no exceptions. I have no choice. Ten dollars or ten days, ten days in jail. But even as he pronounced the sentence, the mayor was already reaching into his pocket. He extracted a bill, tossed it into his famous sombrero, saying, here is a $10 fine, which I now remit. And furthermore, I'm going to fine everyone in this courtroom 50 cents for living in a town where a person has to steal bread so that her grandchildren can eat. Mr. Bailiff, collect the fines and give them to the defendant. And so the following day, the woman received $47.50. Can 
You see, this is the way the grace of God works. God says you're a sinner, and you're lost, and you're deserving of judgment and punishment for all of eternity. And you've done nothing to deserve my love. And yet, the fine is there, I'm going to pay the fine myself. So that you can go free. That's the kind of love that we see experienced in the grace of God. Now the offer of grace, well, there is nothing required to receive grace. Nothing required. You know, this is a concept, an idea that's a little bit hard for us to grasp sometimes. But the scriptures are very clear on this. There is nothing required to receive salvation offered by God. You see, if there's anything required, then it is merit that is involved. But God has already said, grace is without merit from our side. It is totally the work of God. So it is a no-strings-attached gift. I saw a clipping the other day as I was doing some research for the message, and an individual wrote down in there, if you will accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, and if you will incorporate His commandments into your life, you can be saved. When I read that, I said, no, that is not true. Jesus said, most famous verse of the Bible, probably, John 3, 16, what does he say is required in order to receive the grace and the saving work of Jesus Christ? If we just, what? Believe or trust in him as our Savior. Jesus does not say, if you will trust in me and you will live your life or follow my commandments, you shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus never said that. He said, if you just what? Believe. Just trust. Because grace has nothing to do with human merit. It has totally to do with God's favor and love towards those who did not deserve it. Likewise, and this goes along with this, we do nothing to hold on to our salvation. For you see, grace is the total work of God's salvation. Grace, the unmerited favor of God through his love towards sinning, sinful man, through salvation, that grace doesn't end at the moment a person becomes saved, but rather it continues on throughout the whole process of salvation. We are still as much in the grace of God right now as we were the moment we put our faith and trust in Christ. For grace is the complete work of God. And I have yet to receive the full package on salvation. Neither have you. We're still looking forward to the rest of what the Lord is going to give to us as a part of our salvation. True? We're looking forward to the day when we're going to have a new body. Our soul is totally purged of the old nature. There are a lot of things yet waiting to happen. So from the moment of salvation to the moment we finally realize the full implications, it is totally a work of God's grace and not the merit of man. Therefore, we do nothing to hold on to our salvation for it is totally the gracious work of God from start to finish. Now, let me give you some support for this. Because one of the things that we try to drive home here, don't believe it because I said it. Believe it because the scripture says it. All right? Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Being justified how? Freely. By his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Who God sent forth as a propitiation or atonement by his blood. So we are justified, in other words, declared righteous before God through the fact that we were baptized, through the fact that we've been keeping God's commandments, through the fact that we've been good people. Is that what it says? That it isn't free. If it's free, then there are no 
strings attached. That's a concept I think for us as human beings we find it difficult to believe because there are relatively few things in this life that are truly free. I had one of those annoying telephone calls about a week ago and the individual on there says, now I'm not going to sell you anything. I'm not here to call to, to, to sell you anything. And then they proceeded to tell me about the benefits of what they were trying to sell. And I said, aha, this isn't really free. You are trying to sell me. Oh, I'm not really trying to sell you. And I said, yeah, enough is enough, click. <laughs> you hear these things, you know, they say, hey, uh, you know, if you come and uh, you get this product through us, we'll throw in, I, I know what it is, uh, they've got that new walk-in bathroom, uh, tub, whatever that they're selling. And if you get the tub, they're going to throw in free uh, one of those new toilets that sits up higher. And I sit there and I think to myself, who in their right mind buys into this idea that that toilet is going to be free? You know for well that the cost of that toilet is figured in to the overall price. That's what makes God's grace so radically different because it is totally free. There is nothing associated from beginning to end. It is totally the work of God. Ephesians chapter 2, where we're at right now, verse 5 through 10, which we read at the beginning of this message. Even when we were dead in trespasses, you know, got that dead corpse in a body, in, in a box, <coughs> and, and ready to be buried. When we were in that condition, unable to do anything for ourselves, he did what for us? He gave us life. Together with Christ, for by grace you've been saved. Now, that phrase, he's going to go back to it. He's just introducing it here. And he raised us up together, and he made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Then in the ages to come, I want you to note this, he might show the exceeding riches of his what? Grace. Exceeding here means more than enough. So in other words, the grace of God is more than enough to handle our salvation from the start to the finish. And the reason he showed grace through his love toward those who were his enemies and in many cases was able to restore them to make it back to being his children through salvation through Jesus Christ. That will be a testament to just how much grace he has shown toward humanity. And it will be a reminder throughout all eternity of just how much God really loves us and how much he is willing to bestow his grace upon us. Marvelous, matchless grace of Jesus. He goes on to say, that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now look at this, for by grace you have been saved, how? Through faith. That word saved there speaks of a particular uh, tense of the verb. And the tense of the verb speaks about an event that has taken place in the past, but has continued on through the present without any particular time frame in the future where it's going to end. So it's a, something that has started and is ongoing and will continue on indefinitely. That's what the word saved there means. So it means that at the moment of our salvation it got started, but it has continued on to the present and will continue on into the future until such day in which God says, I've finished. And now we can move on. Now what does he say here? For by grace you have been saved. That grace got it started and grace has been working through that salvation right on through the present and into the future until that day in which we see the Lord. 
And it goes on to say, it is not of whom? Not of yourselves. You can do the best you can to try to hold on to it. You can do the best you can to try to prove yourself worthy of it. But I'm going to tell you something, my friends. There is not a single one of us who, if we were to stand before the Lord today and be judged by Him, that any of us could stand there and say, we are worthy of this salvation. None of us are. The only reason we can stand before the Lord someday and be worthy of His salvation is not because of what we have done, but it is because of the grace that God has shown to us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's it. It is not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. I, I love that phrase. It is a gift. If it is a gift, there is no strings attached, right? I mean, what if around Christmas time, uh, let's say I come in with a brand new laptop and I see Don coming in. It'll be a Mac. You like Mac, right? And uh, I bring this Mac in and I say, here, Don, I want to do something nice for you. Here's a Mac, brand new, latest, um, it's, got the, it's got all the bells and whistles you could possibly desire. Here, I want you to have this gift. And he's probably going to look at me and say, okay, what's up? <laughs> and he'll probably be right, because I'll say to him, it is a gift, it is all yours, as long as you fork over about $4,000. <laughs> Now, you don't have to pay it all off right now. You can make easy payments over the next six years at 20% interest, something like that, you know. Uh, it wouldn't be truly a gift then, would it? And yet, that's what many today are proclaiming when it comes to the matter of salvation. They're saying, you come to Christ... He saves you, but you got to do this, this, and this, and this, and this, and this to hold on to it. Then it really never was a gift to begin with. It is something that you have to earn. But notice what he says here. It is a gift. A gift comes with no strings attached. If it's truly a gift, I will say to Don, here, it's yours. What do I got to do for it? Nothing. Ever. Go and enjoy it. Notice how he goes on to here. He says, it is the gift of God, and in case you may think that there might be something you'll have to do to hold on to it, it is not of what? Works. That is the idea of human righteous deeds. So in other words, when we get to heaven, none of us are going to be able to say, well, Brother Don over here, I'm picking on him this morning, uh, Brother Don over here, well, he got to heaven because of the grace of God in spite of who he was. But I got here because of who I was in this life. I truly was a good person and I truly deserve this. There will be no boasting when we get to heaven. We will all bow our knee to Jesus Christ. And we will all recognize that the reason we are there isn't anything that we deserved. It isn't anything that we have done. It is totally what Jesus Christ has done through his gracious act of love in reaching out to us. For by grace are we saved through faith. Now, when you think about all this, it sounds wonderful. After all, people in this world today are being swayed to buy things all the time by being offered free gifts. Free. I mean, that's something that catches people's attention. It's free. That's great. So you would think if salvation was made by God to be totally free, that most people would be flocking to receive it. If it's free, no strings attached. I don't have to do anything but receive it, accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, trust in Him for my eternal life. That's all I have to do. Yeah, you would think tons and tons of people would be rushing in to try to receive this gift. 
But in reality, it is this very truth that is actually repelling many people from putting their trust in Christ and receiving the loving, gracious, unmerited favor that God has shown toward them. You say that doesn't make any sense. I agree with you. It doesn't make any sense from us and our position of those of us who have received that grace. I can't think of what my life would have been like if it had not been for the gracious work of Jesus Christ in my life at the age of seven. He has guided and he has directed me throughout all of my life. I cannot imagine having gone through this life apart from him. And I think that's true of most Christians. But yet, you would think since it's a free gift, everybody would want it. But in reality, most of those who are out there say, if it's free, and I don't have to do commandments, I don't have to do pens, I don't have to do this, I don't have to do that, then I don't want it. If I don't play at least some role in my salvation, I'm not interested. You see, the fallen nature of man does not want salvation to be free. It wants to play a role. It wants to play a part. It wants to be able to say when it has arrived at the conclusion that, yes, Jesus Christ died for me, and yes, he paid for my sins, but I also was a good person. I also followed him. I also did this and this, and that also played a role. That's what they want to say. You, know, you, you look at religion as a whole, whether it be Christianity or other forms of religion, and you see the things that people will go to do, I mean, the extent that they go in, in causing suffering, and sacrifice, and all kinds of things. They go to all kinds of lanes in order to think that they're trying to buy merit and favor from God. And they're willing to do that. But just to open their hearts and allow the grace of God to enter in without doing anything. And they turn their backs on it and say, I don't want it. And unfortunately, those people who turn their backs on this marvelous gift of grace will spend all of eternity suffering for the fact that they turned it down, suffering for the fact that they tried to get to the other side and beyond in their existence through their own effort and their own deeds, their religious rituals, their good works, their law keeping, their charity, and who knows other things that they were willing to do, going on pilgrimages, inflicting self-imposed pain. I mean, they do all kinds of things. Why? Because they say to God, we will not receive your unmerited favor unless we can do our part. How foolish. How foolish. God's grace is wonderful. Is it not? Anyone who has partaken, who has opened their heart and received the unmerited favor of God and his love toward us through salvation in Jesus Christ and him alone, and have experienced that grace, well, tell anyone who asks them, <coughs> has it let you down? Has it been a disappointment to you? Have you wished you never did it? You won't have anyone out there telling you that. No one who's partaken of the grace of God is ever disappointed in what God has done through that grace. And when that grace is finished with our salvation, well, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, that when we receive the completion of our salvation, the toils and troubles and struggles that we have to go through this life will suddenly 
vanish from our mind because they will seem insignificant in comparison to the full implications of the total grace of Jesus Christ and his salvation in our lives. All of a sudden, the losses we took or the physical pain that we suffer, all these things, are, they're going to seem insignificant in comparison to everything that we receive through God's marvelous grace. And so I give this invitation here this morning. I hope and I pray that everyone that is here this morning has accepted the grace of Jesus Christ and is resting in that and that alone for their salvation. Now, we'll talk more next time on the changes that that grace is going to bring about. But in the meantime, we must recognize and accept that what Jesus Christ said, if you will put your faith or trust in me, you will not perish, and you will receive immediately my life eternal. If you have not put your faith and trust in Christ, if you think that because you're a member of a church, if you think because you've been baptized, if you think because you're trying to keep God's commandments, if you think that you are, are going to the services that you've been instructed you have to go to, if there is anything that is attached to the grace of God, it isn't then salvation by grace. You need to let that baggage go. Turn all that over to the Lord. Free yourself of that. You can do that by just opening your heart and your life to the grace of Jesus Christ. Salvation comes through grace in Jesus Christ through faith. If you haven't done that, my invitation to you is, why don't you do that today? Today is the day of salvation. You never know whether you're going to have another day to make that decision, right? How many here know that there'll be a life tomorrow? None of us. I mean, we think we're going to be alive, and we probably will be, but how many of us really know? What a shame to hear and know that the grace of God is there ready and he is willing his arms to wide open saying, come to me and let me bestow my saving grace upon you. Won't you make that decision today? Father, I pray that as individuals are thinking about these words, that as they consider the grace of God, they will finally grasp it. I pray for those that maybe this is new to them, that the Holy Spirit will open their understanding, open their eyes to the truth, and that by going to this truth, they will receive everlasting life. They will receive the salvation that comes by no other means than the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, if there be some out there that have not made that decision, may they make that decision today. May we as Christians so catch the excitement that we ought to have because of the grace of Christ that we might take it out and we might share it with others. For by grace that we say through faith and that unto ourselves, it is God's gift. Not of ourselves, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Bless us, we pray, Father, and we pray this in your name. Amen.